to today is actually the last lecture for course material right in the sense week 9 lecture 3 today we're going to basically wrap up course okay so number 1 we're going to do second order systems time response So finish that up. Second, so on Monday, turn in homework. Do we have one more homework or that's it? This was the last one, right? So, well, homework. And we'll start um, start practicing. I mean, we'll practice problems, not start. We've been doing that through the quarter. So we'll do a lot of practice problems. Okay, and this will lead into like 3720. Okay. In a sense, Ch uh, chapter four and beyond is what is very. Oh, chapter four is what is very very important for 3720, and chapter four builds on all the stuff we have done so far. So, recall where we stopped was we said let's look at the standard form for H2. That is for the second order system, we have omega n squared over s squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared, right? So this is the uh, transfer function standard form for second order systems. Okay. Therefore, our H2 is y over x Okay? So that's that. Um, but basically, we considered, so omega n was the natural, I don't know if I use the word natural, but that's what it is. And you will see there's another frequency associated with this. That's why we said there's the natural frequency, radians per second, okay? And zeta is the damping ratio. And we took, and we looked at the case where the damping ratio was zero, yes? So it was an undamped response, but we'll look at the details today. Damping ratio. So this is dimensionless. Well, that's where we stopped. So today what we're going to do is basically we're going to look at, so today, how do the poles of H2 affect time response? And the mathematics behind this, unlike the first order system, I'm actually not going to derive it in detail because the mathematics behind this is, it's not difficult, but it's rigorous, okay? Rather, what you should, uh, yeah, the math is important. And in 3720, you'll actually get all like, you'll get the closed form expressions, etc. But in this course, what I want to emphasize is what happens intuitively, right? So first, we need to get the poles of H2. Therefore, what are the poles of H2? So here is our transfer function affect time response. Of course, we're going to assume step input just like we did for the first order case. Question or, right. So what are the poles of this guy? So S1, S2. So how are the poles defined? What are the poles called? The what? Yeah, correct. So the values of S for which the transfer function goes to infinity or? Yeah, the roots of the denominator, right? So this is a quadratic, yes? So we have to use the quadratic formula, minus B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A. Or if you actually want, you can stick this into your TI-89 or Wolfram Alpha, or whatever, and actually ask it to solve it. It should get it in close form, right? For... Uh, AX squared, or let's see, AS squared plus BS plus C equals zero, quadratic, okay? So what is our B? So in this, given this, all right? So, huh? Sorry? No, it's the, it's two zeta omega, right? It's this fellow, okay? 
So it's minus, and you'll see this has a very nice form. Right? It's very intuitive. So then same thing with b squared. So which is 2 zeta omega n squared minus 4. a is 1, c is omega n squared over 2. Yes? So this one becomes what? Minus 2 zeta omega n plus or minus square root of 4 zeta squared omega n squared minus 4 omega n squared. Okay? And I don't want to forget the over 2. It's that. So keep simplifying this. So I'm going to pull out a negative 4 omega n squared. Okay? And you'll see why I pull out the negative shortly. It's going to be 1 minus zeta squared. Yes? Over 2. Correct? So this one can be written as minus 2 zeta omega n plus or minus square root of AB is square root of A times square root of B. Yes? But then what is square root of negative 4 omega n squared? So this is square root of 1 minus zeta squared. That's kind of obvious. So what is square root of negative 4 omega n squared? Yes, so JP is exactly right. There is a J, which is square root of negative 1, correct? Square root of 4 is 2, and you get omega n over 2, okay? So this works out very nicely, and this expression you must remember, right? If you forget, you can derive it, but with enough practice, you will remember this. There is a omega n plus or minus 1 minus zeta squared J, okay? So here are the poles of the standard form of the second order, poles for the standard form of the second order transfer function. Right? So let's plot this on the pole zero plot. And basically, it, this is figure 417 from your book. And this is like your kind of like Bible, right? In the sense that one picture will give you all the information you need. So, but let's just plot this ourselves and figure out what's going on. Right? So first of all, we are going to assume that zeta is greater than or equal to zero, omega n is positive, okay? Oops, what am I doing? So here's the real axis, here's the imaginary axis. So where are where is this pole located at? What's the real part? So this is a complex number. Yes? What's the real part of this complex number? So that's over here. Yes? Oops, sorry. That's not the notation because that's not where the pole is. So let me mark it like this, minus zeta omega n. All right? The actual pole, there is one here and there is one here. Yes? What's this? And what's this? Yeah. So what is the imaginary part? Omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared times j. Yes? And over here, it's minus omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared times j. Yes? So, let's look at now So let's look at some uh, parameters, okay, in the sense how so what we're going to do what we need to do So here is the pole zero plot, okay? So here is the PZ plot. We will now understand how pole locations affect time response. Okay? So let's do a quick check. When zeta is zero, remember we were looking at that before? Where are the poles? So here are the actual poles when zeta is not zero. Where are the poles when zeta is zero? Where do they lie? Imaginary axis, right? which is what we found out 
last lecture, yes? So when zeta is zero, you go back up here, you put zeta equals zero, you have plus or minus j omega n, correct? That's exactly what you have here, all right? So let's start with that in the sense. Well, actually, mm, that's too trivial, so let's start with this, okay? So in the sense, uh, okay, so here is the PZ plot. Let's look at the type. Let's do this. Of system behavior. There's a term for it, and we'll go through it. And then Y of T, which is the step response. Okay, we'll get an expression for it. So let's say okay, let me do this. Let me move it to the next page. Mm -mm. Let's say my poles lie here. Okay. That is, I have the poles at minus zeta 1, minus zeta, not zeta, shoot, minus sigma 1, minus sigma 2, okay. So when will that happen, like in the sense, so basically, I have, let me zoom out. So when, uh, here I have complex conjugate poles, yes? I don't want that. I want real, but not equal poles. So in terms of zeta and omega n, what condition do I need for that to happen? Zeta or omega n, you understand the question? So how do I make these two poles, how about this, become like this? So what do I tune? So I, right now these two poles are here. Zeta what? Yeah? Okay, so excellent. You make zeta squared larger than 1, like JP said, right? So, I told you zeta is positive, right? That's what we'll assume. That means zeta has to be bigger than 1. Yes, let me zoom in. So if zeta is bigger than 1, what happens? So the j's are going to cancel, right? And these, you'll have real but unequal poles. Is that clear? So JP is right. So in this case, JP says, make zeta bigger than 1. You'll have real and equal poles. This type of system behavior is called overdamped. Okay. So what you're going to get, the step response. So let's say I put a step input. What do you think is my response going to be? Yeah, correct. So initially it was zero. So it's one defined like steep. Like you're right. So Chris is right. So how's it going to go? It's going to, is it going to do this? No. Yes. So I'm doing stroke. What it's going to do is going to be over damped. Right? It's going to go ugh, slowly, sluggishly. It's going to go towards one. Okay. And the response equation is going to be of this type. It's going to be some constant times minus C value of sigma 1t plus some other constant. And you can solve this. And this is what not what I'm, this is, I'm not going to do this in this course. Right? We'll do this in 3720. U of t. Okay? There is a response. So it's over damped. Too much damping. Okay. What's the next possibility? So in other words, what I did was these two poles, they kind of came together and they split on the imaginary, on the, sorry, on the real axis, when I made zeta big, bigger than one, yes? What's the next thing I can do? What's the, what do you think? So zeta is bigger than one, what's the next possibility? That's correct, but before that, Chris is right, zeta less than one. Yeah, zeta equals one. So what do you think happens if zeta equals one? So Chris, zeta equals one. So what do you think happens? You can go back here and plug it in. So what happens? Yeah. 
if zeta, so you can go back in here, plug in zeta equals one, okay? But you can just plug in zeta equals one here. Yeah, then what do you have? Like, where are the poles? This is what I want to know. Uh, is it on the imaginary axis? Be careful. It's on the real axis, right? So if zeta equals one, this drops off, correct? But does this does this drop off? No. You have a quad. First of all, this doesn't go away, right? You have a quadratic. You need two roots, correct? So basically, yeah, real and equal at negative omega n. Well, you can, like I said, you can get that from this expression, all right? Or plug in zeta equals one here. You get s one, s two is negative omega n. You can get it from here, or you can go back all the way to what we were doing before. Plug in zeta equals one here. You get s plus omega n the whole squared, right? S squared plus two omega n s plus omega n squared. So what do you think this kind of response is? Well, this is called critically damped. So this has the fastest rise time okay in the sense this goes zoom okay, it's not an it's not a pure exponential per se okay that's what it looks like critically done right excellent underdamped will be um, yeah but underdamped has percent overshoot yeah that's right but when I don't want any overshoot, this is the fastest. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to what Chris said. Okay, in the sense. Uh, so how do I make so? How do I make underdamped? Yeah, that's why it's called the damping ratio. So, and I'll put here now zeta is between zero and one. Because what do you think zeta equals zero is? Undamped, okay? So undamped is the pure oscillatory case, and that we really cannot implement that physically because it's always damping. Right? There are ways to get around it. Like if you think of, think about optical oscillators, they have one of the they have like Qs of like 300,000, right? Because light goes 300 around 300,000 times before it dies out. Right? So optical resonators, LC tanks, have like the highest Qs. But anyway, so zeta is between zero and one is our friend, right? The complex conjugates. So this is the one which we are actually going to look at. In the sense, actually, so initially it's like this, then it goes, oscillates, right? And it settles. So your response here, y of t, is one plus b e to the minus sigma d. I'll define what sigma d is shortly. Cosine omega d t plus phi times u of t. I'll do, I'll give you all these definitions shortly. But let me write out the expression for this as well. I I don't remember them. So I don't use them that often. But mm -hmm, let's see. All right, I don't have the book with me, so. Let's just go with uh, what we're going to actually do is we want to look at how these pole locations affect this response. Right? Like I said, this time response we'll deal with in 3720. But there's one final case, which is zeta equals zero, and this is called undamped. that here is the real axis here is the imaginary axis real imaginary and what I recommend you do is you fill in the time response okay from reading your book so uh, students it's in your book right fill it in just as an exercise but this is it okay so four kinds of responses depending on your damping ratio zeta greater than one is overdamped Zeta equals one is critically damped. Zeta between zero and one is underdamped. 
and zeta equals zero is undamped, right? So where is all this like not ap applicable is the wrong word. Let's look at a practical scenario, right? Not example. So let's say you are designing an elevator control system, right? Do you want this? So your steady state response could be what? So let's say you uh, the f destination floor, yes? So you press a, the elevators do have control systems. In the sense, you press a floor button, your your controller starts moving you towards that floor, right? So you, do you want this kind of a response? No. What is that physically? What is this equivalent to? Yeah, bounce around. You don't want this, right? Do you want this kind of response? Not really, because it's like, oh, it goes and then it slows down like exponentially. Ideally, you want critically damped, right? But you got to be careful in the sense you don't want this time scale to be too short. You don't want to make the user sick, correct? So this, this example of this is an example of control design, right? And this again, we're, uh, we're in almost in week ten, so thirty-seven twenty should hopefully excite you, right? This is where you will actually apply all this. Okay, but then let's look at what I've been alluding to uh, for a long time. In the sense, mm, I'm trying to look at my notes. All right, let's figure out, let me define omega d and sigma d later. But let's now, this is the, because I want to get into this. How do our pole locations affect the time response? So let's look at our j times omega n square root of 1 minus z squared. And whoops, that's not right. This is minus zeta omega n. Okay. That's where it is. Oh boy. Should not have drawn these lines, but that's okay. Yeah. Minus j omega n square root of 1 minus z squared. All right, basically, this is your omega d. Okay. So I'll define it right now. So your omega d is your damped frequency. Why is it called damped? It's omega and your natural frequency, right? Times your damp square root of one minus zeta squared. It's not really your damping ratio, but it's square root of one minus zeta squared. And when zeta is zero, no damping, your damped frequency is equal to your natural frequency. Make sense? All right. So now what I want to do is, how do I want to do this? That's what I'm looking at. And by the way, this is your sigma d. Sigma d, and this is definition, is defined as zeta times omega n. Okay, let's do this. We need, ah, let's do it this way. Let's look, we need to look at this angle theta as well, okay? And you'll see shortly why we are doing this. Okay, I think I figured out how to explain this to you, how your pole locations affect the time response, right? Mm -hmm. So what I want you to do, though, is I want you to get an expression for this hypotenuse H first. And you'll see why. So how do you find out what h is? Pythagoras theorem, right? Let's be really careful. We're looking at lengths, right? So what's the magnitude of this? The length. Sorry? No, 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 no. Not the, this one. What's the length? Yeah, it's omega n squared of 1 minus zeta squared. Yes? And like it was correctly suggested, what is the length of this? Is zeta omega n, right? Therefore, the hypotenuse is what? And you'll see why we are doing this. Hypotenuse squared is omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared plus zeta omega n squared. Yes? So what is this? omega n squared, 1 minus zeta squared, 
equals zeta squared omega n squared. So what is this equal to? Yeah, it's omega n squared, correct? So what's the hypotenuse? Remember, your hypotenuse is positive, so it's basically omega n, yes? So now let's look at what theta is. So hypotenuse is omega n. So how do I find theta? So I want to get an expression for this theta, and you'll see why we're doing this. Okay. Perfect. Exactly right. So Chris is correct. So cosine theta is adjacent side. You can also use tan, right? You can use any trigonometric function. But like Chris is smart and he used cosine y. It's ad oops. Not only yes, zeta omega n is a lot easier to work with, but there's also omega n, right? The hypotenuse, correct? So in other words, the cosine of the angle is your damping ratio. Right? And does this make sense? So let's look at this guy. So give me an easy angle for which to check if this is intuitively true. 60 is, oh, it's not easier than that. 60 would work. But zero. Which is zero? OK, easier than that. Yes, yeah, so you could work with zero. Yes, 90 degrees, OK? 90 would work, because what's cosine of 90? So when this is 90 degrees, what? so where is this hypotenuse at? On the imaginary axis, is that right? Yeah, it is right, OK? So in other, so let's start with that, beautiful. So as these poles move, so what we're going to do now is, OK, before we look at the movement of poles, let's define some. Uh, second order system characteristics, okay? So there is no time constant here. That's a first order system characteristic, right? Um, do you remember what the other two parameters were for first order systems? What did we define? So we don't care about the time constant. What are the other two? Come on, go back. We did it like last lecture. No, no, no. Char the natural response, force response is right, but I want time characteristics. So it's the rise time. You don't remember the definition of the rise time? Well, time taken for yep the output uh, response to go from 10% of final value to 90%. It's the same definition, okay, of final value. So what's the difference? So that's there, okay. What's the definition of settling time? Time taken, yeah, for the output to reach, oops, can't spell. Which time do we have? Yeah. And stay within 2% of final value. Okay? Now, for second order systems, there are two more parameters. So, what do you think they are? So, let's look at these responses. Okay? So, here you have rise time, settling time. Make That would make sense here, correct? Rise time and settling time would also make sense here. But looking at the underdamped response, what additional things can you say? What additional parameters you can define? Yeah, Q, that's right, the quality. So it's not, uh, control engineers don't really call it Q, they call it percent overshoot. Okay? That's one, and the other one is peak time. Okay? Note, Percent overshoot and peak time are not defined for the overdamped and critically damped response. Okay? 
What do you think is the percent overshoot, for example, for the undamped response? 100%, right? So when you use these parameters, you got to be very careful in the sense, A, you got to see if it makes sense. B, always remember, the formulae I'm going to give you, they're not really formulae. Okay, think about them as expressions. They're only valid. I keep emphasizing this over and over. They're only valid for this kind, right? In other words, all these expressions we derived, assuming your transfer function is of this type. So what control engineers do is they try to put the transfer function into this type. Yeah. Oh, this just is a notation saying that this is, so this H2 is this H2. It's the transfer function. Okay. All right. So percent overshoot. Uh, so it's percent overshoot. This is the symbol. is defined as percentage of the maximum dis uh, okay. value. Let's be sorry. Let me be more accurate. Amplitude from steady state. Okay. That means among these peaks, I consider this fellow, right? How much percentage do you go, okay, how much is your overshoot from the steady state value expressed in percentage? Make sense? What do you think is the, there's one more, it's called TP. It's defined as the peak time and it's easier if I just, so this is only, so this makes sense for underdamped response, okay? And let's say I look at my y as a function of time. So here's my step. You go like that. So this is my peak time, yes? It's when my output reaches its maximum value. And believe it or not, that's about it. For these four quantities are enough, right? To completely characterize your second order response. So now a couple of items before I give you the expressions for these. Number one, uh, like I always keep saying, these expressions I'm gonna give is defined only for the standard form of the second order transfer function. Number two, I have I've assumed no steady state error, okay? And I've also not looked at how will the poles and zeros of your input, because right now I'm just putting a step, right? I just have a zero, sorry, I just have a pole at s equals zero. How do the, if I have any zeros, how will they affect the time response, right? And we will look at that through examples, but that's a topic for 3720, right? Turns out the zeros only affect the amplitude, okay? They really don't affect um, the form of the response. So let's look at now, what did I start with? The rise time. But then, so let me start with settling time. Settling time is four over zeta omega n, okay? That's the expression. And do you remember, so this is for second order. And the derivation for this is pretty involved, right? It's in your book. Basically what you have to do is like they use this expression because for the underdamped response, you have all four definitions, right? Rise time, settling time, percent overshoot, peak time. So for settling time, they basically make the left-hand side equal to 0.98, okay? And they plug in T equals TS and they solve this. So you can see it's involved, right? Just like we did for first order systems. But can you tell me, so just, it's very easy to remember this. What is the first order? So recall, settling time for first order. So what is TS1? Approximately, what was it? Over what? Was it 4.4 or was it 4? Four? 4 over A, okay? 
So what takes, remember for first order systems, what was your A? In terms of the pole, zero pole, like what was it? So recall, what is the form of your first order transfer function? Come on, you don't need to flip your pages back. You should remember that, right? It was the pole of the denominator, yes? So what is, so compare this fellow to this fellow. Where is this? Right there, okay? Make sense? That's how you remember this. It's four over the real part, okay? It all works out very beautifully. So you see the similarities? Okay. So percent overshoot is actually easy to remember. It's this. Times 100%. Okay. There is nothing equivalent for first order. And the peak time is going to be pi over omega n times square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Okay? Now, for rise time, there is no closed form expression. So, need a table, and I don't have the book with me to determine rise time. We'll do an example of this later. Oops, can't spell. So we're running out of time. So let me do this. Let me do an example, okay? And then starting next week, we'll get into, this is it, this is it for 3050, right? Starting next week, we'll do a lot more examples. So this becomes like very clear in your heads. So let me look at an example. And this is actually an example from your book. Uh, of course, you be this. All right. So hopefully this puts everything together. Since this is example 47 on page 185. Uh, so given system below, find J and D to yield 20% overshoot and TS of two seconds for a step input of torque T. Okay? So let's look at our picture. So here is K. We'll put in the values later. D, okay, so I apply a torque here, I get a displacement, all right? So hopefully this example should like really light up your eyes and your brain in the sense, wow, this, so how do you, I mean, how do you solve this? So that's the question, so what's the solution? Find J and D to yield these following time para time response characteristics. And you know K, K is given actually. Phi Newton meter per radian, but we don't know J and D, so how would you go about solving this? Dun, 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 dun. Silence, but no, think. Write a transfer function. Correct? Hopefully it's second order, but you know it's second order because what do you have? You have a mass, I mean, sorry, inertia element J, dampener D, spring K, right? Write a transfer function. Most important, you got to make sure it's in the standard form, right? If you're going to use those expressions. So what's the transfer function? Let's write it out. I claim that you should be able to tell me what the transfer function is. What is it? Okay. Huh? Is it like this? 
and I screwed up. What am I doing? Transfer function is output over input. There you go. So now tell me what it is. Because this is my output, right? This is my. Yeah, sorry about this. That's right. So 1 over what? That's it. Beautiful. Okay. So if you cross multiply this, I get the time domain expression, right? If you take the inverse Laplace transform, but is that clear? Now, can I directly apply the expression, the expressions for percent overshoot and what is settling time to this? No, why not? It's not in the right form, all right? So we need note we need to rewrite this is very important okay one in the form omega n squared over s squared it's a very subtle point i'll circle this in red because students forget to do this like that okay all right, so how do you rewrite it in that form? Excellent suggestion was what? I think that's it. And my thing is almost going to crash. Or it already crashed. <laughs> Hopefully, it didn't completely destroy my work. <laughs> Shoot, well, that's okay, because I have an older copy of this. All right, so let's look at, uh, let's see, well, it's 9.46, I can't continue. All right, so we'll finish this on uh, whatever example was over here on Monday, right? So... On Monday, what we're going to do is we're going to finish that example and just I'll pick some random problems from Chapter 4 and we can do work on them. But yeah, that's about it. So, and I haven't posted the MATLAB stuff yet. It's just I almost forgot about it, but I'll post it today. And you can also test this. We can also solve this in MATLAB, right? Like in the sense, once we get our J and D, we can do a step in MATLAB and check if we get the right 20% overshoot and whatever the settling time was given, right? So we'll do that and that's about it. So next week is all examples. I recommend you look at problems from chapter four. Because as you just noticed, the chapter four problems will involve everything which you have been covering so far. I can put motors in there. I can put gears. Okay. So like I promised, question is, am I going to have state space on the final? Only like 5%. Okay. That'll be one problem. And most likely it'll be given this um, transfer function, get it into state space. So do the cross multiplication, get it in the time domain, pick your state vectors and just write it. That's what it's going to be. Well, we'll talk about it next week once I recover my...